Welcome to the, the final panel of our Media Freedom in the Commonwealth Conference. Uh, looking at the, at the Caribbean and the, uh, some of the speakers uh, in our previous panel um, very nicely kind of flagged up the fact that um, in, in terms of uh, the, the Commonwealth, Caribbean states, many Caribbean states have a, have a very good record in the area of media freedom. Um, and so it's important that we, you know, we use this conference, not, not just to flag up the problems, but actually to, to acknowledge the things that, that work and think about why uh, they, they work and what we can learn from these, these cases. So um, uh, I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to uh, Yvette Rowe, who's um, academic radio television producer, director and writer uh, from the Caribbean School of Media and Communication at the University of the West Indies, who is going to chair this final session. But thank you very much for, for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. And also thank you to everyone who is uh, joining us uh, now from wherever you are uh, for this final panel in this uh, conference that's been going on, as uh, uh, Philip has said, for around about uh, 10 hours and has taken people to areas all across the globe. So we now come to the Caribbean. This is the, the fifth and final panel. And I'll tell you uh, just how we're hoping everything will pan out. Um, we begin with each of our three panelists giving a, a little introduction of themselves and the issues that um, are of concern to them in terms of press freedom in the region. And we'll engage them in a conversation, um, a discussion amongst themselves, bringing up those issues. But importantly, we'll make sure that we have a, a segment, 30, 30 minutes or so, uh, towards the end of this session, uh, where your comments and uh, questions and the points uh, will be brought up, and that will factor in the discussion, uh, a very important part of how this is supposed to pan out. So without further ado, I'm going to um, invite our panelists. Let me first just uh, give you their names, Karama Maharaj, Aurora Herrera, and Stefan Campbell. So in that order, if uh, Karan, you'd be kind enough to introduce yourself and say a little bit um, about what this press freedom issue brings up for you. I will also say that part of my role is as the timekeeper. Um, and so don't be too disheartened if I might just gently come in and, uh, and uh, tell you sort of time's up. But you've got around about five minutes each, so I'm sure uh, you'll be happy with that. So Karan, uh, I invite you to uh, uh, talk to us about yourself and about press freedom and what it strikes for you. Thank you very much, Yvette, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I would like to thank um, Philip again for the kind invitation. And I'm speaking on behalf of the Media Institute of the Caribbean. I'm going to share my screen. I just put my thoughts together on a few slides because I felt that would be um, the simplest way for me to cover all of the ground and hopefully um, help me keep time. So I am here in my role as president of the Media Institute of the Caribbean. Just a little bit about me. I've worked in all forms of media. Um, I was born into the world of film. Film distribution and production is my family background. But then I moved into journalism and have worked in radio, print, um, television, and a lot of events management. Um, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. is my job. I am, my paying job, I tell people, is in radio. I'm managing director of Caribbean Lifestyle Communications. I'm an owner of three radio stations in Trinidad. And I'm also vice president of the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce. One of the things I enjoy most is mentoring. And I think that's why um, my colleague, Wesley Gibbings, who a lot of you may know, was able to coerce me into helping form the Media Institute of the Caribbean, which was formed really for 
practicing journalists and we are really dedicated to developing investigative journalism in the region. That is our main priority and objective. Out of that, we have started to other journalism type programs. So everything from digital and mobile journalism to understanding software that helps bring the stories alive to many other facets. But we are really about training journalists in the pan-Caribbean region. Um, my objective is really, I want Caribbean people to tell our Caribbean stories and amplify them to the world. Um, I think I started to get tired of seeing news entities from the outside come in and do their own spin and not understanding our culture and our context very well. And the Caribbean diaspora is vast as you all would know. We have more people from the Caribbean who are living outside of the Caribbean than we do have in the Caribbean. My greatest joy is my son. Um, I'm happy that he was on spring break and ended up at home during the lockdown in Trinidad. So I'm fortunate to have him. MIC is responsible for one child right now. I call CIJ and our, our baby. Um, it is the region's first investigative journalism news entity. It is a nonprofit news entity. It's a very challenging thing to keep it nonprofit, but we are going to keep it nonprofit. And we are really about multimedia storytelling, and that's because the multimedia stories can travel well on various platforms. So whether it's radio, TV, print, digital, um, or to channel it through social media outlets, it was purposely designed that way. So when I got the brief, there were six areas um, that I was asked to address. And so I just threw my thoughts together on it. The relationship between effective media and democratic accountability. I think we all know we're in an era of fake news, disinformation and misinformation. And that is the greatest challenge for credible media. There is self-censorship. It has always existed globally. I think it exists more in, um, in the Caribbean community. And that is because with our island nations in particular, we, um, everybody knows everybody. And so the self-censorship exists for two main reasons. Safety of journalists, and because the journalists do have a fear of victimization, we have several cases where journalists have, have come to some of us who are senior in the industry and said that, you know, they were threatened or they were told to stay off of this story. The other reason is because perhaps 50% or more of ad revenue at media houses in our region come from state entities and government. So when you look at the slice of the revenue pie and you were to... Um, portion, it's state plus government, you're going to see that a lot of that supports media houses. So when it comes to uncovering things like um, corruption or people may be named and so on, and there may be links to government officials, um, media houses tend to stay away from it. They also will stay away from stories that may involve larger companies who also sponsor their programming. Dangers of political developments and the rise of populism. Well, all thanks to the internet. We can't damn the internet, otherwise we would not be having this Zoom conference call and be able to connect. So the internet is a good thing, but you know, it's a bad thing when you have things like bots and algorithms and it becomes a platform of opinion only with no fact checking. There are citizen journalists, commentators, opinions, and while it's good to have varied perspectives, the question is who is feeding the facts to the population? You do have a lot of people who cannot tell what is right and what is wrong, and it leads to a lot of problems. We need to have media literacy built into all of our social systems so people know they have to check things. WhatsApp is widely used in the Caribbean and Latin America. I don't think you can be a citizen of any country in our region with not have, without having WhatsApp. It's a staple. And um, I use this example all of the time. When my mother got her iPhone about two years ago and discovered WhatsApp, her class of 1971 started to have all kinds of information spreading. I even saw aliens above churches. And my mother would constantly send these things to me and say, did you see this? And I would have to constantly say, mommy, it's not true. And so I had to... <laughs> 
I had to ensure that my mother, you know, understood that she had to fact check before she, before she forwarded these messages. So when you hear the word media literacy, we're not to think of the youth, we're to think of the older population as well, because they don't know any better. And I wanted to make that point. The role of intergovernmental, commonwealth, and civil society in protecting media and freedom, there are five roles that I think are very, very important. Advocacy, collaboration, dialogue, cooperation, and defining best practices. In yellow, I've highlighted um, different pieces of legislation, and I see a spelling error in my first line. But freedom of information and access to information more or less speaks to the same. We just call it different things. There are six countries in the Caribbean region that have this legislation. I have to tell you that for investigative journalism or for journalism on a whole to be able to get to the truth of any issue, we need to have better freedom of information and access to information legislation. There are several loopholes. One of those speaks to management of the economy. And um, it's a very broad term, but very often politicians use it and hide behind it. And so journalists cannot get the information they need to be able to tell the stories appropriately. It also allows for fake news to filter through everywhere because if you cannot get the information, then you cannot get the truth to be able to disseminate to the public. There are things like cybercrime, data protection act, data protection in Trinidad. One of the clauses has not yet been ascended to by the president, but if it does get passed, it means that our sources will have to be disclosed. So it's a very serious issue. You then have the issue of criminal defamation that still exists in some of our countries, whistleblower, interception of communication, and procurement legislation, all very important. And I think that we need to have more discussion and collaboration on these. The impact of changes in technology and sustainability, well, news is able to get out there more quickly, but also fake news. And we are in this space of digitalization that has been spurred by the pandemic. And the question is, is digitalization in our DNA in the Caribbean region? MIC actually has a three-day upcoming webinar, half-day sessions, December 1st to 3rd, where we're going to address digital reporting and reporting on digitalization in the region. So it is really a question of how we adapt, adopt, and evolve to ensure sustainability, not just as journalists, but as end users and citizens of our countries. Then what about those who are marginalized or prone to marginalization? We had the classic example of online schools during the pandemic. Many children and young adults did not have access to the internet. The impact of COVID-19 on media freedom, you are the first group to know that the MIC just um, commissioned, but finalized its commissioning of a survey um, called COVID-19 and the impact um, of COVID-19 on journalists in the Caribbean. It will be published early next week. It was done um, with the support of UNESCO. Well, 54 4% said that it has had a financial impact. Many media houses in our region had to lay off staff with businesses closed, there's no revenue. 40% said government officials were hesitant to share information. 27% said government only shared info at press conferences or via press releases. They found that that was insufficient. 45% said their ability to report was impacted. 66% said they had to find workarounds if they had to keep their jobs. What was very interesting was that 62% of them said they were unable to do any investigative reporting. And that's because a lot of governments um, were not disseminating information or answering queries, and there is a lack of FOI and ETI um, legislation. Karan, I'm Example. just going to give you a gentle reminder um, that, we're, that to, to, we're coming out of time. So Last time. Okay, great. Okay. My last slide, examples of good practice from across the Commonwealth. I think that we have very strong media associations whose aim is to protect press freedom. So whether it's the journalistic type associations like Matt in Trinidad or PEG in Jamaica, or it is the associations of media owners like TTPBA or MAG, I think that those kinds of associations um, help us tremendously. 
And we had started to work together in the region. So also Guyana Press Association, Barbados Press Association. And once we continue to develop um, in that way and realize that our borders are only because of water, but our culture and history make us one, I think that coming together on a lot of issues will help us to survive any of the press freedom threats that there are. Information exchanges such as this are also very, very important. And so um, with that, I, I guess I will give it um, back to our host and to my colleagues on the panel. Thank you. Hi, Yvette, you're, you're muted still. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, what I wanted to say is thank you very much, Karan, for your presentation uh, there on those issues. A lot of food for thought there. And so I'd like to now turn to Aurora Herrera um, for your introduction of yourself and your thoughts on press freedom in the Caribbean. Thank you so much, Yvette. Um, and I just want to also say thanks to Philip and uh, for inviting me onto the panel and to Dr. White as well um, for being that liaison. Um, I do, uh, I will just speak a little bit about myself, but I'll also share my screen uh, because I do have a presentation um, to share. Um, I, so I started in journalism quite a long time ago when I was about uh, 14. Um, and then I went on to do, uh, to work for, um, a broadcast company called Gaia, the channel. And then I eventually went to Toronto to do my specialist in journalism. Um, and then afterwards I came back to Trinidad after a few years and I worked as a broadcast journalist for five years. And then I went into making films and, uh, TV, well, TV shows. Um, and then I eventually came to my PhD, but the doing my PhD in journalism and um, specifically media law, researching journalism culture and how media law affects journalism culture uh, goes back to actually when I first started journalism when I was 14 and I worked for a certain media house and my then editor uh, was told to retract a story because it was uh, quote unquote too political and it wasn't what they wanted to publish, or I suppose they were coming under pressure to retract the story. And she refused and then she lost her job. And I was 14 years old when I saw that and I was working for that media house. And since then it's sort of, it's been my drive and what propelled me to uh, come this far and then to do this study um, in journalism culture and media law. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, and Yvette, just the email say the email did say five to ten minutes, so I'm just going to try to make as much time um, uh, take advantage of that. Um, so I hope everyone can see. Um, so, so I just want to quickly bring your attention to the fact that Trinidad and Tobago um, is ranked 36 on report um, on RSF's press freedom in index. And even though it's not particularly dangerous um, physical environment for journalists, there aren't um, a lot, there are murders or kidnappings um, frequently as other countries within the Caribbean and Latin America who are closest neighbors. Um, our media laws and the environment within um, states and privately owned media outlets contribute to self censorship and a chill which extends beyond the threats of heavy fines and jail fine. Uh, Kiran did point a lot to this um, about about the self-censorship and the fact is that every, it's a tiny island, everyone knows everyone. So part of my PhD research, I spent six months in Trinidad doing ethnography in six different newsrooms. Um, and I interviewed 130 journalists and I, I spoke to them about journalism culture and also about media freedom and if they felt that they were free. So I just put together some quotes on different topics uh, and for you to see what they've said. So in terms of self-censorship, one journalist from one media house says, even if I were to get an investigation of somebody in one of the group, one of the group's companies, sorry for the spelling mistake, was engaged with fraud or doing something, if it is not in the company's interest, I can't write that. I won't even bother to go to my editors with this because it is what it is. I know the story is going to get buried, so we are going to have to run it from a certain slant or not run it at all. 
and I don't want to accuse anybody, but there might also be fair reprisals, so that is demotivating to journalists, especially those who believe in freedom of the press, or the states, we need to probe and ask questions, but the reality is, in this company, you cannot. Um, and that's a journalist working for one particular media organization. And interference, which is another um, issue that we have in Trinidad, um, one journalist said at a certain media house, there's government interference, which is the reason um, me and all my colleagues left, because people in government would call the higher ups in the company, and on their behalf, the higher ups would be sending out all kinds of instructions. So this particular media house is a hellhole for that. There are instances I know of in the last two decades, in the last two, three years since the PM, PNM came into power, um, there were people who are an anecdotally understood to be financiers or maneuvering government image, reputation, and perception problems. Uh, and then in terms of advertising, which Kiran also spoke about having a piece of the pie, um, there, then there are allegiances where the government tries to influence sometimes where there's a threat of calling advertisements, but that is a government to company level. That's not on a journalist level, but it trickles down. It can affect the psyche of a journalist saying I'm on the straight and narrow and I'm pursuing the truth. And then the company pulls a story that you're doing because they get a call. No, you can't run that, you can't run it. Obviously you're going to be demotivated. What is the point? I've seen other people in the newsroom get told not to publish because an advertiser was involved. And I've also seen the request for details to be removed from a story because either the company was involved or a rival was involved. The rival picked up the phone and called the CEO. Sales is basically selling a show slot as part of their packages. I've had to substitute this show many times and you get people from sales forwarding you requests. So these are people from sales to the journalists forwarding them requests. Now they're kind of saying only if you have space, but I think the pushback from the news has been, you guys can't do this, but then you still feel pressured because it's an advertiser and how do you say no? And that is speaks to the economic model that we have in the Caribbean uh, and you know, as in Trinan's figure as well on the economic models we have, as you've seen during COVID have crashed and we've had layoffs and it's not sustainable. Right now there um, there's one news organization who's printing another news organization's daily newspaper because the other one can't anymore. So the, because of the economic model we have that is so completely dependent upon advertising, we have so many of these issues that um, uh, repress media freedom. Uh, Karan also mentioned a couple of laws in her slides, so I'm just gonna go a bit more in depth. Uh, the Libel and Defamation Act, um, section eight states, if any person maliciously publishes any defamatory libel, knowing it to be false, they're liable to imprisonment for two years and to pay a fine. Section nine is similar. If any person maliciously publishes any defamatory libel, liable to pay a fine and imprisonment for one year if convicted. So this is hanging over the heads of journalists to this day. Uh, cybercrime bill is a bit, uh, it's very interesting. Um, clause eight states if a person is liable, um, the, um, if convicted, a journalist can find 100,000 TT and imprisoned for two years, or conviction or indictment be fined 500,000 in prison for three years. So this was something that was flagged up internationally by reporters without borders, by RSF, and they did send a letter to the Prime Minister, Ben Pam Singh, um, that they had concerns, and they referred specifically to this section, section 18, it can pose an obstacle to media freedom of the press, um, and it could be used to penalize journalists and media organizations for publishing reports on corporate corruption revealed by a confidential source, even if the journalists earnestly believe that the source is legally able to share information. So this is a very, very serious um, uh, um, imposition on, on, um, on press freedom for us. Um, with the Data Protection Act, any person who willfully discloses personal information that's committing an offense, again, the fines are similar. Um, 50,000 or imprisonment for a term of three years and upon conviction, uh, a fine of not more than 100,000 or imprisonment for a term of not more than five years. Media houses will be subject to a fine. So, um, and as well, Karan did mention um, the potential, having to potentially reveal sources which is um, would definitely kill the investigative industry that we have. Um, and one thing that one editor in chief said about the Data Protection Act, which um, could happen, she said, I, I mean, what will you fill the paper with if you have to ask everybody who's in a car crash if you can use their name and age and address? And what if they're in a coma in a hospital? So basically, if they're unable to answer your questions, if they're in a coma, then you can't get any information or data. So how do you go about doing any stories? And that's essentially what it trickles down to. 
um, which is just the inability to publish something without having this immense fear of being um, found um, uh, guilty or having imprisonment or fines. So I think in terms of questions, some things that we need to look at in terms of media freedom, how do we get journalists to stop self-censoring for fear of losing their job and other ramifications when working on one working in, sorry, such a small close knit society, which is too accustomed to upholding the status quo. And then how do we move towards balancing media laws that chill the work of journalists and responsible journalism? Uh, possible solutions um, to deal with the self-censorship, carry out research to find out what is covered and what is not and why. Um, of course, I'm a big believer in doing research to find out the causes of things and to put proper policies in to address them. Um, look into conglomerates and their advertising policies, make moves towards regulation of advertising during airtime, we must redesign the current economic model. Um, with regards to government interference, introduce a law which restricts interference of governments. These are all things that I've just, you know, thought that may, that are possible solutions. Um, but I think just as journalists have a law, if they cross the line, why can't, why, you know, maybe it's worth thinking about if there should be a law which restricts government's interference. Um, also fact checking and media literacy. Um, which Karan's but so I won't go too much into that. But I think it'd be really great if we did have more Caribbean and Commonwealth fact-checking um, agencies, uh, and maybe as she, uh, you know, um, have a more of a pan-Caribbean um, partnership with regards to fact-checking and media literacy as well. And regards to media law, amend the Cyber Crime and Data Protection Act to include special provision for journalistic work, and then repeal jail time for libel and defamation law, and as well look into the Freedom of Information Act, which um, we and I know that MIC is currently working on. So that uh, I hope I've kept the time. Um, I'm not sure. Yvette, how did I do? Is that okay? Um, so that is my. I actually don't know how to get back to the main um, page. But that is my um, my my short presentation. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Laura, for that presentation. And yes, we were fine on time. Um, and obviously, again, a number of things uh, that really give us a more holistic sense of some of the challenges to press, press freedom, particularly for this area. So thank you for that. Um, so now um, I want to invite um, Mr. Stephen Campbell to introduce himself and uh, give his take for us on the challenges in terms of press freedom that he sees uh, in this region. Stefan. Good, good afternoon to the people in my time zone. Good evening to the people in, in, in the other time zones. Uh, I am Stefan Campbell. I am an assistant lecturer at the Caribbean School of Media and Communication. So Ms. Yvette Rowe is my esteemed colleague. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure, Philip, for, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, my background is primarily on the radio or the broadcast side, having done work in, in Trinidad and Tobago and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And on the print side, specifically in, in, in the city of Montego Bay in Jamaica, where I now reside. And so I... I straddle both the academic and the professional side in terms of the journalism and also teaching the future journalists. And some of the points that Aurora and Kiran have mentioned are some of the things that we've sought to incorporate in our curriculum because it's not just about the practice. It's about understanding the media ecology, particularly in Jamaica, that allows it to maintain such a high, such a high position on the media, on the press freedom index so it is currently at six it fell off it fell off a couple of years ago it went to eight now it is back at six and interestingly the things that create the environment for 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 such a high level of press freedom in jamaica are the same things that can 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 be taken away so easily so so for example the legislative the legal framework you know the passing of the access to information Act in 2003, and also the, 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 the changing or the updating of the Defamation Act, removing criminal libel, ensuring that 
uh, any, 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 any charge against a person has to be brought within a, a particular time. These are the things that Jamaica has benefited from. However, those same laws, let me talk specific, specifically to the Access to Information Act, in terms of the documents that are exempt, a lot of the descriptions are very vague and have been used as reasons to prevent access to certain information. In addition to the fact that the some of the documents, the format of the, the format of the documents. So for example, in one of the investigative stories that we were working on last year, looking at one of the contracts, it was in PDF, but not in PDF in a way that the, the computer can read it. So think of this 100 page, the 50 page to 100 page contract that comes as a photograph because you can't copy and paste. Think about the delay in having to go through this, not being able to copy, not being able to search in the document, as simple as it is. So in other words, yes, we are giving you the information, but we're not necessarily giving you in a format that, we, that, that you can necessarily use. So that's as subtle as it is, it can be a major hindrance. Let's, let's fast forward to the Data Protection Act that you know, Kiran mentioned and that Aurora mentioned in Trinidad and Tobago. The language is so general and so vague. And yes, one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that they said is that you need to declare you know, who your sources are. However, one of the elements of the Data Protection Act is that the same limiting of the time to bring a charge that would have taken place in the Defamation Act. This is also, it's so, so in other words, if you don't get it from the Defamation Act, we're getting it from the Data Protection Act. In terms of the, the window, the time, it, it can take for someone to bring charges against you. So as a journalist, this is something that can potentially loom over your head and can lead to self-censorship. The other element as part of the ecology is the fact that Jamaica has benefited from, you know, privatized media, the, the liberalization of, of, of media houses and all of those things that allows it to speak more freely on some, on some topics and some issues. But however, a lot of these private interests are also part of the boardrooms of these media entities. And there have been clashes, there have been issues. And yes, although you want to illuminate the dark spots and the dark places, you also want to put food on your table. And it, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is a significant note, and which is why I said it has contributed to press freedom in, in, in Jamaica, but as simple as it is, it can, it, can, it can be taken away very quickly. And Jamaica is a larger Caribbean island than, 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 than the island like, like Trinidad and Tobago that where I'm from originally, but it is still small. It is still very much connected the political and the private interests are still very much connected. You are still known by a, a certain group of people. So it is bigger, but it is still small in comparison to other countries and other territories. And so that is another issue that is going to prevent someone from, 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 from wanting to report on certain issues. And although there have not been widespread reports on journalists being attacked, there was one in 2019 where, 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 where a, a, a reporter was attacked in, 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 a, in a political rally. And all it takes you know, is for the right type of language from the mouth of a, a, a politician or a representative to turn this into something that, that, that becomes very violent towards a journalist. And, you know, even if you look at social media, some of the discussions that are taking place in terms of the sentiments towards journalists and media practitioners are moving to the right wing very quickly. And I think it's because of our, of, of our proximity to the United States and what's going on in the United States, the era of Trumpism and fake news. And a lot of people are parroting these things on social media and in these platforms in addition to the fact that there are many so-called news platforms, they are going as, as far as to have the same font, the same style of BBCs and the Fox and all of these things, but a different name, 
so that when you click on these things and you see these things come up in your YouTube feed and all of these things, you believe and it sounds like it's, it's credible. And then when you look at it, you see a different type of agenda. And so these are things that can have an impact on the trustworthiness of, of, of the journalistic practice because the average individual does not or is not able to discern between or among the types of, of media entities and outlets. So yes, social media and the internet has allowed us a greater level of access to information. But as Kiran said, there needs to be an equal or even greater level of fact checking. Even yesterday, I got a message on WhatsApp about something uh, and then the entire chat was talking about, they can't believe this, they can't believe that, they can't believe the other. And I, I had to post a link from one of those fact-checking websites to say, this is not a credible page. And so, uh, but, but imagine the amount of spaces and platforms where this is already taking place. It has been shared hundreds and thousands of times and, and people are not even considering these, 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 these things, right? And so that ecology, understanding how these things are interrelated and correlated is something that we try to show or to add to the students in the classroom as a school of media and communication, because I think a fundamental part of changing or even maintaining the level of press freedom we have is ensuring that the, the journalists to be that are going out into the industry are very much aware of some of these issues, right? I think that is one of the solutions, understanding or equipping them with the type of critical thinking to be able to discern and to identify some of these problems. Another benefit that we have in the Caribbean is it comes to some of the networks like, you know, the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network, understanding that we are stronger together and understanding that although there might be some laws that are limiting a particular journalist in a particular, in a particular territory, when we come together as a, as a, as a, as a unit and, a, and as a group, there is a greater strength, there's a greater level of support, there's a greater level of information. And so there's, a, there's, all, there's even a, a, a macro level of analysis so we can understand that we have similar problems, similar issues. If you listen to what we've discussed as a panel, you realize that there are a lot of similarities that if we dive deeper, if we delve deeper and continue to report on these things, not just share them among ourselves, but to let the wider society understand why these things are significant. It is going to continue, it's going to maintain the level of press freedom that we have, that, 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 that a lot of us enjoy, but it is also going to improve our standings, standing in the minds of the audience and in the, in, in the eyes of the world. So I will leave it there for now, and I look forward to the questions. Stefan, thank you uh, very much uh, for that presentation on this issue and your uh, introduction and uh, some of the, the issues raised. So it's time now to uh, turn to uh, discussion, and I'd like to start you off by looking at a number of things that are in common and often we think about freedom of the press, we often think about violence and attacks and, and threats to journalists which are very um, serious and really mitigate against press freedom. But among the things that have come up from our three speakers are some other ways in which press freedom can be compromised and some of the areas were in terms of the economics of it, in terms of almost some kind of censorship and lack of freedom by marketers and by uh, uh, the advertising, the need for advertising revenue, that you might be doing a story that is not um, advantageous to a major advertiser and the risk there that they pull their sponsorship and that becomes uh, something of a problem. Uh, the other thing that struck me was I was listening to the presentations and I saw where they were talking about $100,000 uh, Trinidad and Tobago dollars uh, 
fines and I started writing down dollars. But then after that, we heard about these prison sentences, a year in prison, two years in prison. So um, let's look at how the legal framework uh, can affect press freedom in the region. And I wonder who wants to uh, uh, start us off with that, the legal thing. This idea that you're a journalist and you're doing your work and it could lead you not only to a really big fine, but possible prison time. That certainly must be a compelling reason to think about self-censorship. So perhaps, uh, uh, I don't know if you can go to Kiran um, for, a, for a first thought on that and uh, take the discussion from there. Right, I'm off mute. Yeah. Um, this has been the, the legal aspects. I'm not an attorney, although I think I should have taken, taken my courses being in media, I've been fighting a lot of these issues, I think, for close to as long as I've been in media, 25 years now. Um, the onerous thing is not just for, for journalists who can be fined um, and, and, you know, have penalties under this, but also the owners of media. So, um, you know, if my, if my newsroom were to do something and, um, and then it, you know, it, they have to face defamation of any kind. We still have criminal defamation. And I think that's what Aurora was, um, was looking at. Um, I also will be fined and imprisoned. And so we tried um, to partner with the International Press Institute, IPI, which I'm sure a lot of you would be familiar with. They're the world's oldest press freedom organization. And in 2012, we held a World Congress meeting here in Trinidad. And and we then followed up with speaking to the attorney general and the prime minister, trying to have that um, criminal liability removed. They removed one part of it and they left the other part. And um, I think it's just a way for them to ensure, and I say this for all governments, I'm not singling out that regime. I say this for all and not just in Trinidad, but I know there are similar penalties with legislation in the region. It's a way for them to keep a check on us, to make sure we keep a check on ourselves. So you have this constant fear in the back of your mind that if I say that, you know, I could end up in prison or in court. And then where does it go? Um, and the fact that even if you said it as a journalist, even if I found I had sufficient documentation from my source, but I wanted to cross-reference my documentation with um, government documents, which we should have access to, to, to I cannot access those, those documents because under the Freedom of Information and the ATI, I just can't get it. Um, the ATI works best when I think of our region in Jamaica, but definitely the, the FOI in Trinidad is, is not as, you know, it's not as, as, as free as it should be um, for journalists. So the thing is, I am then cornered. So... The, the other issue we have is what, what legislation supersedes what legislation in our environment. Um, our culture of putting together legislation in this region, unfortunately, is a cut and paste. So if you were to look at um, similar legislation out of the UK or of other Commonwealth countries, and I look at India and Australia because I, I looked at Data Protection Act and those countries, you would see that clauses are exactly cut and paste, but then the exclusion for journalists are not cut and paste. So then you look at it and you think, well, what happened here? You know, here's clause D, cut and paste, but when I look down clause I is the exclusion and it's not there, you know. So, so it leads you to believe that this was intentionally done. And to me, the point we are at now, realizing that the Caribbean has to be integrated for us to move forward. We have to be our own block, our, our own continent, but the seas are merely rivers. We have to stop thinking of it as borders. Um, because our legislation is very similar, it's all hinged on British legislation, we should really come together and develop a framework. And that is one of the things that the Media Institute of the Caribbean ha has started spearheading this year. We think that if you had 
a proper model and framework for things like FOIA, ATI, or data protection, that it can easily um, be adopted by each Caribbean country or those of us in the Commonwealth, most definitely. And that's where I would like to see it go. That's where a lot of um, media practitioners and managers in the region who have, who have spoken to casually, that's where we think it should go. And I think that's something that all of us on this uh, meeting today um, should advocate for and should look at more closely. Thank you, Karan. And uh, on that seeming note of stronger together, trying to find a way to combat what must be very chilling, the idea that you can go to prison or uh, have a, a, a fine, and not only the journalist, but also the media house. Uh, I'd like to ask Aurora um, to, to step in here. Um, is there a way around this? What's the, the way forward? Um, well, I, I wanna, I'll take it back to my research because I think a lot of what Kiran has spoken about, um, you know, she's covered a lot of ground already. Um, and I think uh, in my research, what we found is a lot of this goes back to the economic model and the dependency and not having the resources to do certain things. So for example, during one, um, my, one of the ethnographies that I was doing, um, the particular managing editor told me that we get um, uh, uh, like threats all the time and they call them, um, I'm sorry, I'm just blanking on the word, but these le uh, the letters that, they, that uh, the letters the lawyers send to stop from publishing. I don't know why I'm forgetting the story. Um, pardon? Injunction. An, in, an injunction. An injunction to stop publication no, 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 until no. Um, before judgment. No, but I'm sorry. Anyway, um, but uh, it'll come to me. Um, and yeah. the thing is that a lot of these, the, the size of the media house really has a lot to do with how much you can take on. Are you a conglomerate? Do you have private funding? Do you have state funding? Are you a tiny media house? Because if you are, if you have an investigative project going on and your journalist is very, uh, is very convinced that they have strong documents and they've double checked and everything is, is, um, is very, uh, cease and desist. Thank you, Debbie. Um, <laughs> um, if you, uh, if you and your documents are all in order, there are some media houses that have the money to back you because, and if they get sued, they have the money. Whereas in another ethnography I did, it was for a smaller media house and their funders came more from a sort of board of companies rather than from a conglomerate. And they absolutely cannot take that risk because they'd be defunct. So in terms of you know how uh, even if they even if you want to back your journalist and you do feel that they have everything in order just that fine and you know those fines are five hundred thousand dollars etc those are incredible fines um, the the you can you just can't pay for it and but some can and also that speaks to the um, the um, the how competitive the industry as well and if journalists had better sources and also this also goes back to training journalists properly um with regards to checking sources with regards to um teaching them about the laws etc and how to properly go through with an investigative project um and also paying journalists properly because as stefan mentioned journalists will they they have to put food on the table um and that is something that i've come across in my uh interviews as well where journalists go, I really want to do better. I really want to be better, but also I need to feed my family. And this is the job that I have. And even though the company is repressing my freedom of speech or I'm um, self-censoring, I have no choice. And that was something really heartbreaking to hear. So in terms of getting around this, it's not, a, it's definitely not a one, any, you know, I suppose Stefan and Karan spoke about it. It's, it's a very, it's a very complex multi-level issue that starts at the very basic with the journalists themselves and, and the level of training and respect and, and, and funding and money that they get and resources to um, the company being able to hire lawyers, the company being able to have those resources and have a legal team as opposed to another media organization who may be doing fantastic work, but they just can't afford to go to court. So um, in terms of getting around all those issues, I think addressing each of those issues on those levels 
are just an, are just really parts of the whole that we need to look at individually to move forward together, not only as individual islands, but as, you know, keep um, Kira and Stefan say together as a Caribbean um, region. Okay, and uh, you bring up the e economics and maybe a smaller media house does not have the funds to even think about looking at a lawyer, what says even engaging one, and another media house may have the resources, but again, they may still say it's not worth the risk. So I want to bring in um, uh, Stefan here. This idea of uh, where do we get the money for the free press? Is there, and it was mentioned by our speakers, a different economic model that would help to mitigate against, you know, where you get your money from within, within one of our smaller uh, countries, in as much as many uh, organizations may depend quite a lot on, for example, government advertising. So one way, if I don't like what your, what your press is doing, is I'm not going to send any advertising your way. Or perhaps as a government, you uh, might also be able to put a block on some of the means of production. You know, in uh, um, many decades ago, one way was to make sure that a newspaper couldn't get hold of newsprint to actually print uh, the, the newspaper. So the economics of it, do we need a new economic model? Or how do we balance this? And so I'm um, wondering, Stefan, what your thought on, on that is, the economic model and press freedom. Yes, there needs to, in addition to the, uh, a, a, a new economic model, there must it must start first with the consideration of it. I think uh, e even a lot of our students, the 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 aspiration is to graduate and go and work for one of these media houses, uh, and, and 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 the cycle perhaps continues because it's when 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 it when it's only a job, and you have to put food on your table, and you don't feel like there is any other choice. Then, 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 more often than not, there is that self censorship. So, so Kiran mentioned the the nonprofit model, which is something that it, it, it might sound like 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 a misnomer or, or 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 something that that doesn't make sense because it's something that we don't often talk about, right? Perhaps we need to help the the, the next generation of journalists understand the econom the, the the economics behind it. Right. I know we touch on it in certain courses, but truly understand that this is not just about words on paper, but there are a lot of other things in the ecosystem of a journalist that can have an impact on the quality of a story or whether your story even sees the light of day. So technology also has allowed for different streams of incomes. So there are a lot of journalistic podcasts that get their money from 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 placements and all of those things right from click throughs and all of those things um so like the podcast i have that's that's a, a, a certain level of funding comes from that now as i said this is one element that oftentimes we we perhaps do not consider but it would be good for us to expand our thinking in terms of the 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 how the journalist survives, how the how 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 equipped or how adept they are in seeking funding for grants for for investigative journalism um, journalism stories and projects. These are the things that I think we need to delve a lot deeper. And as Kiran said, you know, the Media Institute of the Caribbean it has 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 done a lot of that. But I think as a region, we need to expand that type of thinking. As as and as I said help the, the, the new journalists or even the existing journalists understand the media ecology, how these things connect and can have an impact on their stories coming out and their quality. And that can't happen if everyone is operating in a silo. That can't happen if we are only seeing one type of economic model or we only believe one type of economic model exists. That can't happen like that. It has to be an expanding of thinking, sharing of knowledge and information, drawing reference from other places so that they can see that the economics is linked to the legislative. The legislative is also linked to your personal choices. 
Okay, um, thank you. Um, in the uh, little time that we have before we go to uh, the open up the discussion, I wanted to turn away from the challenges. The fact of the matter is that uh, press does get done and stories do get done. And really just ask our panelists to weigh in on, despite the challenges and the things that are mitigating against, how, how has it been going in the Kevin? How do you get these stories out? Are there some success stories, any models to, uh, to, to look to, to how do you deal? You see what the challenges are, so how do you deal with it? So who wants to maybe come in on that? I feel like we're playing around the table, so I guess I'll go first again. Um, I just want a clarification again, Eva. You said, how do we deal with the challenges? Yes? Yes, so I suppose I wanted to, to, to look at, yes, we've got these challenges, but certainly some freedom of the press obviously does um, happen here in the Caribbean region. And it's just some real thoughts on how do you make it happen? How do you get around some of these challenges? You, you have to make, I can speak from a media manager's perspective because I think the media managers and, and the editors in the newsrooms are the ones who have to get together and realize that, listen, the environment we're in, it, we have to make some hard and fast decisions. Um, and we have to recognize that we cannot be, be to, you know, be for everyone. You know, the shoe doesn't fit all anymore. And so we have to decide, is this the route I'm going to take? And what am I going to lose if I go this route? Um, and I say that with the investigative reporting in particular. Um, there are news entities that I think are trying now to take that approach of, if I were to start doing more investigative reporting, what, it, what will it really cost me? Or if I do investigative reporting, do I do more on the human interest side where um, there is less likelihood of of me having any kind of political stigma attached or of me losing revenue. I mean, those discussions have been happening um, in, the, in the hierarchy, but I think it really comes down to, you have to just decide, you have to take brave steps and you have to have the courage to do it. And, and from the CIJN and MIC perspective, I mean, that's what we did. Um, I chose, my radio stations don't do hard news, but we do a lot of special features, um, a lot of what people would call podcast type things, but we don't do hard and fast news. And that was a conscious decision since the inception of the stations, you know, um, but on the CIJN side, we had to make a decision if we were going to do this, could it survive as a nonprofit entity? And, um, and I chose to do it that way because I did not want our journalists to have to be afraid to say anything. I wanted the truth to get out. So we knew that we would never be making millions of dollars. We would be making far, far less. But we felt that getting the stories out meant a great deal. And we have to serve the public interest. And so sometimes you can't serve the public interest and expect to profit out of it. Um, by the grace of God, we've been able to survive because you know we have contributions from foundations and a few private um, citizens and entities. They don't give a lot, but every little bit goes towards us getting the job done. And I hope that it will continue. And that's why I say you have to make sacrifices. You just have to understand you have to do it. I also think that our journalists are not given sufficient um, moral support. We have great journalists in our region I don't like the fact that many of them come to me and tell me how stifled they feel. I think there's a lack of understanding within all, some of the organizations as to how much journalists have to put out. Journalists and salespeople to me are almost the same. They put out the most, you know? And so um, I think more discussions have to happen with, between senior um, personnel in newsrooms and media management. And, um, and I think it's starting to happen because when I look at the students, even from Caramac and, and from the Ken Gordon School of Journalism, he had Costat in Trinidad, very, very, very bright people. 
and entrepreneurial journalism is upon us. So if they're not going to get employment from the legacy media houses, I am positive they are going to start doing their own thing and they won't be reinventing the wheel because it has been happening in other places in the world. But there is space for entrepreneurial journalism. So I think we are at the point where we have to look at what is my business model? What do I want to achieve both as a company, as an individual? And if I know that, I know the answers to both those questions, then how do I redesign a model that best suits me? And I think that, we're, that, is, that is how we're going to deal with the challenges. We have to adapt, we have to pivot, we're in an era of pivot because of the pandemic, and we have to recognize, we have to face the challenges head on. Thank you very much, Karan. Now, um, thank you for that. I want to uh, ask uh, other two panelists to defer their thoughts on that question because uh, we're really now coming up to the time where we want to devote some time to the uh, questions uh, coming from our participants uh, in this session. So if you will uh, be kind enough just to defer on that and uh, we can uh, go and I will look at the questions that are coming in the chat from our participants and throw them out um, for you to consider. So. Um, what we have here then from Nicholas Watts is um, he's asking, were journalists safe to report freely on the contested Guy Guyanese um, election recently? Now, um, if you have particular you know, information on that or particularly just a concept of, of that. So uh, that question there from Nicholas Watts, um, who, who would like to uh, jump in on that? Anyone particularly um, for kind of uh, conditions? Yeah, the, the information I have, Nicholas, is yes. Um, Nazima Rockbear, who's um, in charge of the Ghana Press Association, is actually an MIC board member now. And um, yes, they were able to report freely. Um, the issue is, though, while they reported freely, a lot of them were, you know, things that they had to face a lot of slurs online and people pushing around pushing them around at meetings and that kind of thing. But yes, they reported freely. Okay, thank you for that. And um, any other perspectives from Stefan or uh, Aurora, or shall we go on to our next uh, next question? I'll take that as a yes. So uh, again from Nicholas, um, hi there. Are there examples of transferable good practice in fact-checking in the, the Caribbean? So there's a, other examples of transferable good practice and fact-checking in the, the Caribbean. Um, I have to say not that I'm aware of, and I don't know if my other two, uh, co co my other two colleagues can speak to this. Um, I do know there are a number of uh, Latin American um, fact-checking associations out of Mexico and Argentina um, that have been doing really great work um, but I'm not sure within the Commonwealth or, or um, the first hand. Stefan? I think when it comes to when it comes to reporting on certain issues, and, and this is this is you, you asked about the strengths. So for example, the access to information, being able to corroborate or to, to counter what has been said by a, a source or somebody who who is under investigation to say, this is what you said. However, this in the contract, which in, in for example, the story we are looking at the impact of China, China in the in the Caribbean, that that's when we got our hands on some of the contracts, we were able to say, you said this. However, the contract in fact says something that is a little bit contrary, and I think that's why the, it is so important to be able to access the, um, that type of information. The other thing is there are a lot of databases that, a lot of databases in the Caribbean that don't necessarily, um, how do I say this? A lot of international databases have information on the Caribbean, right? So even though you don't get it within the region, there are sources or platforms or databases that have information on the Caribbean that you can draw a reference from. No, I think we need to get to the point where we start 
generating our own data and creating a database and expanding on it. But again, going back to the networks, the, the, the networks, the regional and international networks, and being able to access this sort of information, I believe uh, is, is something that is quite transferable. It would be good if we had a designated, as, as Aurora said, if we had a designated organization responsible for fact checking. They don't do anything else but, but call people on certain things that would be excellent and again i think that is something that is going to come out of of very strategic collaborations among ourselves as a as a region um if i could just add to to what stefan's saying um one of the really interesting things i came across uh during my ethnography was one of the media houses said we no longer we do report the news but we don't think we will be first because you know in bigger countries they have a 24 7 news um, whereas in at least in Trinidad we do news at 6 a.m. and then midday and then 7 p.m. That those are usually you know how it's been that's usually how it's been historically. Um, but now, uh, and as uh, you brought up um, Stefan a while back, you were talking about um, people who have become you know journalists and more like citizen or peer journalism that's going on right now. And the trustworthiness has, you know, media credibility has taken a hit because you see different things on different platforms and people aren't verifying. There's so much misinformation. The, the media house I spoke to, the, um, the lead journalist said, we, our job is now one of verification. We, all we do is verify. We do not, we know that we are not going to be first on the scene every single time. Now we're taking a step back and our job is to make sure that everything that comes out from us is completely verified and I thought that was a really wonderful way to deal with the influx of misinformation that was ha that's happening in society and all the peer journalism that's going on and um, they so in terms of adaptability and how some organizations are dealing with it and to go back to your initial question about how we've overcome overcoming challenges this adaptability I think was something that was really um, it was just great to see that they they dealt they, they're dealing with the fact that they know they're not going to be first on the scene but now they've taken on the rule as the official verifies of information. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, we now go to uh, William Crawley has a, a question for the panel. What lessons do the Caribbean media have for their British counterparts on the reporting of race or minority issues? And it's uh, somewhat topical, I think, at the moment. I think that have, yeah, I think that you have to be really sensitive and aware. I really don't think we're a minority anymore. I wish people would stop calling us a minority. I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We are people, we just have a different background. We're Caribbean people. If anybody asks me where I'm from, I'll tell them the Caribbean because I have a mix of about six ethnicities in me. And that's very normal in our region. So um, I would actually like you to start calling us a minority and call us Caribbean, you know, or call us something else and then be sensitive to the issues. Um, it has to start with the, what we call mainstream media. I really hate to use that too. But in simple things like looking at what is on AP, Reuters or BBC images, you're not going to see a lot of Caribbean type people represented. I got really upset on eye stock photos up to yesterday because I was looking for some stock footage. I'm going like, there are no brown skin people in here. What are they doing? You know, and I was really looking for entrepreneurs around the table. I needed a shot of that and I couldn't find any. And I have to revert to stock images because of COVID. We can't pull people in for photo shoots and that kind of thing. And I think so what people have to start realizing is that the media needs media everywhere needs to start building their databases and libraries, being cognizant of the fact that there are people of all um, creeds and races. And I wish really they would stop calling us a minority and putting us in a bucket. Um, I have a bit of an interesting story unless Stefan wants to go before. No, go ahead. I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll go after. <laughs> so this is something that I feel very passionate about and about representation for Caribbean people, especially in, or, you know, and, and I, I, I'll just use the, the phrase Caribbean people um, uh, in the, 
if, for example, in the UK, because as you as you know, I'm in the UK currently, I have actually been to see two separate edits of the Latin American Caribbean um, uh, desks at the BBC. So twice I've scheduled meetings and been into them to say, um, I'm, a, I'm a media researcher and I'm from the Caribbean and I'm not seeing representation of Caribbean people very much in your shows and in your in your products and on your TV shows. And the thing is, in the UK, there's a um, I am I'm completely for public media, uh, and there, but that there's a, there's a licensing fee that people pay, and I think if everyone's paying a licensing fee, everyone should be represented. Otherwise, you know, why am I paying <laughs> a licensing fee if I'm not seeing myself and I'm not seeing what I want to see on television? I think the in terms of the lessons, the BBC needs to be more cognizant of that. Um, when I did speak to these two separate people, one the the feedback I got was, well, we we're putting a lot of funding into the Middle East stories and American stories, so we don't have as much funding for Caribbean stories. And Debbie's here, and you know, I I also know Neil, and I know the BBC Caribbean service was something that was really um, incredible back in the day. Um, but now, and then my understanding was that about six or seven years ago, it it ran out of funding and so then you know now we have this um now i know that they have sort of stringers in the caribbean which they get stories from but they're not servicing the diaspora here and i think to a very large extent it's it's um it it, it has been frustrating and i and i um i do completely agree with kiran in terms of the lessons to be learned are um you know to more represent definitely more representation across um within the within the media but and also i know funding is an issue but i think if you again it's not it's not fair that if you have people who are paying for your products and they're paying for a service they deserve to get representation in that service just okay. to, uh, so, so it's, it's so what i'm saying is really just complementary to what aurora and kirana said so I am finishing up my PhD in social policy, and yes, one of those, one of the elements of social policy is understanding that how you label a group of people has an impact with the lens through which you view them, and and I think something that should be adopted, you know, you know the British counterparts is understanding how these lenses affect how we report on people. Uh, how we translate their own story into a story that sits well with us. And the long and short of it is that in addition to reporting, we need to give people the platforms, the opportunities and the space to tell their own stories, right? Um, telling their own stories is going, to, is going to help to change our understanding of different groups of people, not minorities, it's different groups of people. Right and understanding the the struggles that different groups of people have, whether it's in the Caribbean, whether it's in the United Kingdom, whether it's the United States. So it's not just about reporting; it's also about creating the space. But on the policy level, I think we need to start looking at media policies that 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 create a certain type of equity in our reporting. It is well established, it is well understood that there are gender inequalities in reporting. There are also racial inequalities in reporting, and that's globally, right? So I think that's something that the, the, the Caribbean has done better simply because of what, Car what Kirana said, because we are all a uh, miscegenation of a group of people. So we are forced to understand each other, starting with our own families, right? And so I think that experiment is something that should be, that should inform policies in other places that see, that, that are seeking to understand different groups of people and seek to report and represent different groups of people. Yvette, if I could add to that, if it's okay. Um, there are, so the CBC in Canada, they have a diversity and inclusion plan that they started back, I believe, in 2015, and they're committing to different things, and they've done it for 2021. Um, what they do as well within their so with their plan, they uh, they're doing training modules for journalists within the within their um, ranks. They are also uh, looking to hire. So they have, I mean, I hate to use the word quotas, but they must have you know, a person um, of indigenous or some sort of um, other group of people to use Stefan's words um, in different positions. And 
it's it's absolutely it's a mandate that they have to now they've set these goals for themselves and they put various things in place to achieve those and they've been um so far they've been reaching the goals uh but it is again a multi-layered operation in terms of increasing diversity and inclusion and also people with disabilities etc and this is all included in them so i know we're talking about learning from the caribbean but i actually do feel that uh, cbc has done and it as a public broadcaster because i saw someone put some public broadcasting questions there um they they are doing a great job in terms of diversity and inclusion and it's 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 uh, some uh, an organization that we can learn a lot from as well okay thank you so i'm going to turn to a question from the chat and um, there's a question going to come from Debbie Ransom and also I see David Page so I'm just letting you know that we're um, aware there. So this question is coming in from Balasubraman Chandra Mohan. Would a regional approach to good practice as well as legislation help? Would that be via the Commonwealth or CARICOM? So would a regional approach to good practice as well as legislation help? And if so, would that be coming through the Commonwealth or perhaps CARICOM? So. Um, I, I think it should be CARICOM. That's one of the things that MIC is advocating for um, with the Freedom of Information and ATI. And that is simply because um, we work on so many issues together as CARICOM that I think it's, it's much easier for us to address and adopt accordingly. Um, and, and that should be the approach. And so We've actually had a very preliminary introduction um, with the CCJ um, and the CCJ Academy, and we are looking at seeing how we can um, perhaps work with them to do some, some kind of a forum where we could start the discussion around that. Okay, uh, thank you there. Um, like to, you know, I think that if that answers the question, uh, Debbie, Debbie Ransom, do you have a question? I don't know if you can use the raised hand or um, put it in the chat. So uh, there's a question coming in from Debbie Ransom. And then after that, we have a question from David Page. Um, um, good evening. Hello. Um, good evening from London. Um, can I just first of all say that it's been absolutely marvellous to hear, well, first of all, to catch up with the vet and old colleague from BBC Caribbean, but also to hear what this next generation of journalists are doing. I am so proud of you all um, in your, your workarounds. It was ever thus, finding workarounds. And um, I mean, we go back, Kieran, you mentioned um, Wesley. Well, when Wesley, Andy Johnson and myself were trying to launch Matt in the first place, um, I'm showing my age now, um, you know, that was such a hard task to get to work out who was a media practitioner, who wasn't. And that comes to my question, observation, something you might want to consider. Um, one of the things um, that's been running, a thread that's been running through today, and from London I've been dipping in, from Australia, right the way through South Asia, through to the Caribbean. All the panels have talked about the challenge of so-called citizen journalism. Anybody with a mobile phone feels they're a journalist, yeah. Um, so what I wanted to put to you was a very quick snapshot of how I have found the credential process has worked from a young reporter in Trinidad when we're about to launch the police commissioner report. I don't even remember that brought down a Trinidad police commissioner. Um, and I got a phone call the Saturday night as a very young reporter in, in, um, in Port of Spain. And I it was a police officer telling me, we know where you live. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the end, the report was published out of Barbados, written out of Barbados. It brought down the police commissioner and a whole cabal of officers who were involved with the drug trade. But later in life, I had, right, yes, the BBC credentials later on. Um, today in the UK, we have the National Union of Journalists. You have a card for that. And that gives you a certain amount of support when you go somewhere. I'm on the executive for the Commonwealth Journalists Association, and I can tell you that since the COVID lockdown across the planet, more and more journalists have come to us applying for cards, freelance journalists who just need a body to back them. So they've got something to wave in a policeman's face 
when they haven't got something back in them. So what, what it brings me to is to ask whether you might want to consider as you take on board the new battles of today, a uh, CARICOM wide credential system, a process with the backing of heads of government, because if you manage to get that solid network there, um, then not every man with a mobile phone in Laventil can say, I'm a citizen journalist, I've just recorded this. You start to get a certain momentum, and then you add to that, um, right, you've got the card because you, and we only give the card to people who can prove they've written three professionals published stories in the last year. That's the way we operate. So that way you get rid of everybody with a, everybody with a cell phone. Um, and then onto that, you can add the pots of training, the funding, and you start to build up a, almost a backbone that gives you that, um, that veneer of professionalism that you can then use um, so it's just it's a it's an, a series of observations leading to a suggestion and a question on whether you think that accreditation might at least help you to a certain extent against the rise of citizen journalism. Thank you, thank you, Debbie. So the question put out there is whether or not uh, one feels that uh, the system of accreditation, a system of accreditation, can really help against the, the rise of citizen journalism in terms of the ways in which I'm, I suppose it is becoming a, a problem for the actual press. So um, I'd like to put that to the panel. I'm just going to ask you to be, I know it's difficult, to be a little bit brief on, on that um, because we do have a question from David Page, which we do want to get to. But accreditation, you know, and some kind of system. Who would like to take that one from the panel? Don't hearing anyone? Accreditation. How can that help? Well, Karen, oh, yeah. so, Karen's mic was, she was on mic, so I thought you were about to speak because your mic was oh, on. Kieran, uh, uh, mic, oh, okay. I, you know, right. it's, it's it's uh it's i was just having a conversation with a colleague about it yesterday because we were saying you know the medical profession the legal profession there there are essentially these barriers to entry but anybody could take up a phone and create a website and a platform and call themselves a journalist and get certain number of following and feel like that validates the entire process. So the simple answer is yes, I do believe, I do believe there needs to be that, 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 that level, that, that level of, 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 of formalization, or as you said, accreditation. Now it is that, that again, that requires some agreement among the, the, the institutions and the groups and the associations as well. Um, but I like that. I think that's a very good suggestion that you said three professional um, stories within a year, um, despite the platform. I think that is something that is definitely going to be able to distinguish us from. No, I think I, I, I don't personally, I don't have an issue with a citizen of a country bringing something to light. I do have an issue with us conflating the two the, so so it's like comparing a a, a professional doctor to 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 a, a, a witch doctor right and saying that these two have the same level of accredit, accreditation and, and and we should view them in the same light and so i do think that is definitely going to help with distinguishing this is what we are this is who we are this is what you are going to get in terms of quality and as kiran said journalists and salespeople would just as hard, right? And so to understand that the, the product, which essentially is what we, we are putting out, the product that we are putting out is supported by, is certified by this, 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 um, this, this, this body, this group, this framework. Okay, thank you, Steph. I know you want to... that David has, oh, we need to get to David's question, but I just, um, not, uh, and definitely not to be, and, and that's a great um, thing that uh, Debbie has brought up. I just, in terms of the you know, mechanisms and working of um, the, at least in Trinidad, 
um, I think we need to just maybe realize as well and keep in mind that a lot of the, again, because of the lack of the resources and the fact that um, journalists can't be everywhere, they do depend quite heavily on videos that they get from Instagram or Facebook or Twitter from citizen, citizen journalists. Um, and that is a lot of their bread and butter and how they get stories. So that, I think it, it is worth sort of just taking that into account um, that because of the lack of resources, that is definitely something that they also depend on and whether or not there's a negotiation between the citizen and the, and the media and the journalists from the media house and how that will work. Um, that's of course up to, up to the both of them, but it's, we, the resources definitely do, um, that, is, that is a condition of the lack of resources, so. Okay, thank you, Aurora. And in a sense, you're saying that let's not just forget that there is a role for the citizen journalist to play. Uh, just um, Karan has also uh, thanked Debbie for the uh, the idea and mentioned the Caribbean media workers have a card and maybe that should be pushed uh, further. Um, so we are um, running down the time. And as I did say, we have a and thank you to all the panelists and everyone else. We have a question from David Page, which I think is going to be our last question. Um, and would the panel like to say something about the state of public service broadcasting in the Caribbean? And obviously it ties in, and uh, you are going to be under the, the gun of succinctness and uh, uh, make, it, make it a great point, but make it without too much time. So, uh, well, Aurora's, you're on our screen. What can you say uh, about uh, the state of public service broadcasting in the Caribbean? Well, sorry, Very I think Kieran's mic was on, so I just thought she was going to speak. Sorry, did someone you're else? Right. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll go first. There is no real public broadcast service. There are government-owned media that I think are propaganda machines. They compete with private media. How can you be subsidizing government media, state media, and then competing with private enterprise? You have all of the equipment, all of the resources at your disposal that private entities cannot because they cannot afford it. You are pushing out what is strictly government propaganda. You're not allowing opposition to have much airtime on those frequencies. Then I don't see how it becomes a public broadcast service. Our population does not really contribute to those types of entities in our region. So I really think we don't have public broadcast service. What we have is, is government-owned or state-owned media in this region. Propaganda. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Kieran. So that just between public and government. Stefan, go yes. ahead. So, so for example, the PBCJ in, the, in, 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 in Jamaica, the Public Broadcasting Corporation, if you look at the programming changes just as the the government changes right and in terms of how they talk of, of about the, the the content and all of those all these things quickly shift and you know some of our students get employed there and they would be quite frank they know they understand that this has nothing to do with the public interest but everything to do with showing the public that the government in power is doing something uh, fortunately, I don't think they, they they do well to compete with the with the with the private entities, but they do have a presence, and and they will show like the parliamentary programs and all of those. But as far as that goes, that's where that's the state of public broadcasting in Jamaica. So it's an idea not particularly being fulfilled. Thank you, Stefan and Aurora. Um, looks like you'll have a last word on this uh, question. Um, I of course well I agree with uh, both 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 my um, panelists uh, co-panelists. Um, the thing is that uh, so the quote that uh, the one that I had about government interference uh, was was taken from a journalist who worked in our um, state-funded channel. And so the one about that they would get calls from upstairs and they would uh, say you need to pull this from the show etc. So ministers would be calling in on people from the government at that point in time and saying that you can't run the story and. I do think that, I mean, it would be great to have um, public public media and public interest media um, officially, but I think for our environment, media ecology in, the, in, in Trinidad, and in the, at least, I can't really, I mean, I'm not gonna speak for the rest of Caribbean, I think in Trinidad, um, 
it's not possible at this time. But I do want to say that I think that our companies and media organizations are trying to do a good job of public interest journalism and public, and, and they do keep the public's interest at heart. And they do work really, really very hard to uphold um, the best interest of their citizenry of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aurora. And also thank you to um, our panelists. We're coming in uh, with a, a minute or so to spare. I invite you all, if you're not already looking, to take a look at Nicholas Watt's comment on some of the, the, the responses to the questions that came up in the discussion. Um, my understanding is that we'll be standing by shortly for um, concluding comments on in regard to the overall uh, conference. I may be, um, I think that's where we're going and we're at uh, 1428 now. So I might just uh, take the risk and ask if anyone of the three panelists is, has, a, has one final, final word for us to close the discussion on press freedom in the Caribbean. If anyone wants to take that one up. All microphones um, are open. I think that yeah. half a minute, which I know is ridiculous, yeah. but I go think, <laughs> no, I think that it's it's um, it's very important that as many of us um, get together and try to advocate for the issues that are facing us. I think really the survival of our region hinges on that because you know the, the press, the media is really is really a representation of society. And if we don't get our voices heard, then our societies are going to be lost in the future. So I really welcome this kind of forum, and I hope that we have more of it. And um, I thank all of you for the opportunity today. Thank you, Kiran. And uh, thank you to our panelists and also um, to the organizers of the, the conference for giving us this platform and this opportunity to discuss Things have been raised. There's so much more to say, but at least we start uh, saying it. At this point, I'd like to thank all of those who uh, participated and joined and those with the questions and listened to the presentations today and to wish you all well. And I'd like to hand over now to Philip Murphy, the, the host, for the concluding comments. But thank you to everyone. Thank you very much. Well, thank Philip. you, Bet, for your superb chairing of this session and keeping everyone brilliantly to time. And it's been a fantastic panel. Um, I keep, I kept wondering throughout the day. Surely we can't can't keep up this this standard. But each each panel has been absolutely wonderful. And um, Stefan, Aurora, Kieran, uh, you really did a brilliant job. So thank you so much. I'm so glad that this is recorded. And I, I would just say, I'm going to keep my comments fairly brief, but really as, a, as an initial comment, please let's keep in touch. Let's um, build on the networks that we're starting to create through these, these global uh, conferences and see what we can do with it, see what we can, you know, in terms of longer term collaborations between our institutions and, you know, research in, in this area. Um, so, uh, I, just a, a few very brief comments. It's, it's fascinating how across the various um, time zones and regions we've looked at from the Pacific and the Far East, South Asia, Africa, Europe, and now the Caribbean, similar issues have come up in different contexts. And just maybe mention um, very briefly, seven areas. Firstly, the political climate um, and the increasingly problematic political climate, the rise of what one speaker earlier on today called the elected autocrat. And not just that, not just governments who are prepared increasingly to use powers and express explicit hostility to journalists, um, but an increasingly polarized climate uh, one of our speakers described how journalists who should be, he said, holding up a mirror to their societies are instead being recruited in as foot soldiers in an increasingly polarized political battle. Secondly, there's the, 
the commercial and economic ecosystem in which journalism is is functioning and and a number of people mentioned that in the panel just now um not just the tendency for large corporations to eat up smaller uh, media enterprises so that they become powers in their own right but also a, a failing business model um, of press enterprise which is increasingly no longer able to afford the really important investigative journalism painstaking investigative journalism which has been so important to the functioning of, of democratic societies thirdly the legal frameworks in which journalists have to to, to operate and we've heard from around the world and increasingly increasing i mean uh, including just now um the different sorts of laws and prohibitions uh the journalists have to face from colonial era sedition laws uh blasphemy laws in pakistan criminal libel uh and then of course the range of national security and anti-terrorism legislation uh and more recent modern uh, laws around cybercrime and data protection acts. Combined, of course, with, as, as um, Aurora was saying just now, the natural tendency of journalists towards self-censorship faced with a range of pressures. And against that, you know, the more positive legal developments like freedom of information legislation, it had been really interesting to, to discuss that more broadly and whether that really does provide a kind of counterbalance, useful counterbalance for journalists. Fourthly, external influences. China didn't really come up in this panel, but it certainly came up in, in earlier panels, and I'm sure that it's relevant to the Caribbean cases as well. The tensions between combating fake news and disinformation uh, with the need to maintain freedom of expression and the problems that face, face, faces government. Sixthly, the Commonwealth itself, um, we're sort of contractually obliged as the Institute of Commonwealth Studies to talk about the Commonwealth in these contexts, but it's fairly clear that the Commonwealth's soft power isn't really sufficient to counter the influence of some very powerful institutions in the media ecosystem. And finally, and something that's come up throughout the day, and Debbie touched on it really in her, in her question and comment, this issue of solidarity, um, the, the one answer to the problems that journalists face is solidarity of various sorts. Um, through regional organizations, the support of governments, but above all the, the, the solidarity of journalists themselves in terms of defending individual members from uh, attacks and persecution, but also in terms of defending professional standards of journalism from the so-called citizen journalist. Um, all of these issues have been explored in really fascinating ways in different regional contexts. So thank you all so much. We will be making these sessions, the recordings of these sessions available very shortly, I hope. And, and um, uh, thank you all so much for contributing to these wonderful discussions.